uh, and his teaching is more about the heavenly realms, you know, the heavenly realms, because uh, we will see, like we said this morning, that there is more than one heaven. And these heavens, you know, they fighting one against the others. And uh, so we will see, you know, who inhabits those heavens and how they fight and how there is, you know, uh, the communication, you know, on the reality of one and the other. So, you know, we're gonna uh, just work out all of, uh, of this. So in Mark 3, Jesus said, and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. So he's speaking about a house, you know, so his you know, place. And, uh, and he said, you know, then this house has to be united, you know, has to work well together. And we know, for example, in the church, how it's important the unity in the church to work together. To be of one mind. What says in Acts, for example, uh, often repeated, you know, they were of one mind. You know? But all, not only the church has to be of one mind, we know that even the enemies, you know, is, uh, uh, is working of one mind, is working unity. Because if it's divided, you know, it will collapse. So when uh, we speak about this house, it's speaking about Satan. You know, like I said, and if Satan, you know, has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. He means Satan is united. But I speak, uh, Satan is not just one angel. You know, Satan, he means a kingdom. You know, he means a kingdom made of demons. You know, different demons, they are working together, you know, in unity, in a structure, you know, to conquer another kingdom. Now this is what he's all about, spiritual warfare. You know, just, you know, kingdoms are work one against the other. You know, and armies are working one against the others. We feel what we do not know. For this reason, we have to reveal the act of the enemy. We have to give the believer the, the awareness that there is an enemy, and that he wants to destroy us. But here we know him, we will not fear him, anyone, and therefore we can defeat him in a battle. And you know, my subtitle for this for this book is uh, "The Strength of Our Enemy Ends Where Our Faith Begins." So it's a battle of faith, actually. You know, is the 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 real you know uh, weapon is faith. Amen. Yes. And uh, as a church, you know, we give space, you know, to Satan when we don't fight, you know. But here we fight in faith, then we conquer him. You know? So, uh, so that's uh, started to see about, you know, the war in the heavenlies. And from the beginning, you know, we read about forces who want to rule over the world. Which part do these ancient forces play today are, and how they uh, adapt to the modern world? In this course, I will teach on what the Bible tells us about the demons that rule our world, known as uh, principalities and powers. In the first part, we will look at how to recognize them in the history and map of a city using Rome as example. In the second part of the book, we will embrace the weapon that God has given to the church and how to use them. Now, we have ways to balance things. So uh, when we uh, speak about, you know, the demons, his armies, you know, how he attacked the world, uh, is okay because we want to, you know, and discover, you know, we want to, you know, unmask the enemy. Well, we need to know the, our enemy, but we have, you know, to uh, to keep in mind, you know, the balance of it. It means the church is much stronger than Satan and his army. We are on the winning side. Amen. Jesus has already conquered it all. You know? We are just to apply the victory of Jesus. You know, and it's a victory, and then it's done. You know, it's like. Uh, if uh, a super weight, uh, you know, a uh, boxer, you know, go against, you know, a small child. You know, you know who's winning anyway. 
But you know, to uh, say then you know the champion has won, there must be a fight. Yeah. You know, even if it be a fight of you know two seconds, because on the field blow, you know, the child will be on the floor. There has been a fight if you want to, you know, uh, say that this one is the conqueror, this is the champion. And the same thing is with the church. Jesus has given us the victory. We have the victory, but here we don't apply to the word. Because some churches, they say, you know, we don't need to fight the enemy. We don't need to do spiritual warfare. We don't need, you know, to do these things. You know? And one thing and I said is that, uh, anyway, when you worship, you do spiritual warfare. When you preach, you do spiritual warfare. When you go out and testify yeah. you know, to people you give, you do spiritual warfare. You know, when you pray, you do spiritual yeah. warfare because you know you advance in the kingdom of God. If there is the kingdom of God advancing, there must be another kingdom retroceding, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So is spiritual. We are in a war. It's not that if I like it, I go in. If I don't like it, I don't go. No. If, for example, Germany, you know, decide to make war to England, you know, the English people will not say, oh, but I don't care, I'm not going to war. No. no, you are in a war because you are an English, and you are in English territory, and you will be engaged in a war, even if you don't like it, you don't want it, and you don't care about it. So is the Christian, the Christian, he's in a spirit of warfare. You know? If he likes it or not, and if he fights it or doesn't, you know, it's a fact. You know, then he has an enemy. You know, he speaks about the enemy of our soul. Yeah. You know, then he's going out like a lion, you know, looking for who can, you know, devour. He doesn't speak about the people in the world because he has already them. You know, mm -hmm. he has already the sinner. He tried to devour the Christian. He tried to take, you know, a, a Christian into, you know, uh, defeating him. So you now we have this word, but we are on the winning side. So the second part of uh, of the book and on this teaching, I will show how we apply our armies and how we win when we apply the armies. You know? So, but first we will go and see you know, the Satan. The Satan is a dictator. You know? Satan has an army that controls territories that are under his dominion with a perfectly organized hierarchy. In this way, he rules nations, cities, and areas that are delimited by real geographical borders. In those areas, he controlled people through sin, the occult and false religions. Until he is faced with a higher power, nobody can stop him. That is why I say the power of the enemy stops where your faith begins. We will also see how it is possible to oppose these evil powers by putting on the armor that God has given to the church. Jesus made it clear that this is a violent world. And the church is called to attack. The following verse shows it. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. So, you know, Jesus spoke about war and violence. The letters of Paul spoke, you know, about spiritual warfare, and the other letters too. So, you know, it's normal that we are in this uh, world. And the, the, thing, the other thing is this, that Satan is the dictator. What does he mean this? You see, a king, you know, we now live in democracies, so we maybe don't, don't understand very well, you know, how this works. But in ancient time, you know, people had a king. And a king, he's a king because he's born king. You know, he's not elected. You know, don't, you know in England, they don't elect the queen. Right. You know, the queen is queen because she was born from a king. You know, and next king will be king because it's born in that family. You know, so it's something you inherit. A dictator is somebody then take it by force. Take uh, his dominion, take his power by force. The, the dictator usually use the, the army, you know, to conquer their own land often and to keep people under dictatorship, so, you know, under his power. And... Uh, and so, you see, Jesus, we call him the king of kings. Jesus is a king. Why? Because he's born a king. You know, the Gospel of Matthew shows us that he is, you know, the son of David. You know, and he is a king because he's born a king. He, has, he doesn't need election, you know, he doesn't need to prove it, you know. He's just born, and he knew. 
he is the king. Since the day he was born, when other kings, you know, uh, went to give him homage, you know, he always knew that he was and he is the king and he will be king forever. But Satan is a dictator. Satan had no rights on this earth, you know, but he took them, you know, how? Deceiving Adam and Eve. You know, with deception, he took the power on this earth, and with the army, with an army, he kept it, the power. You know, but it's not his, because God, when he has created the earth, he gave the dominion to Adam, isn't it? He said, you know, to Adam, have dominion on this earth. It means rule this earth. Take care of this earth. You know, make it a beautiful garden where you and your children will live. You know, this was the intention of God for Adam and Eve. You know, to have children and to live in a beautiful garden um, is this earth. You know. Satan came, he took over with a deceitful you know, um, liar and then he kept it in the same way. You know, but he has no right. Who has the right over the earth? Jesus has the right over the earth. You know, when he came and he conquered with the cross, again, what was being stolen from Adam. And he has the right as the king to rule on this earth. And he decided to rule through the church. You know, so for that, we are his ambassadors, you know, the ambassadors of the king on this earth. And we have the right on this earth. You know. So now on the earth, we have this battle between a dictator, Satan with his army, then keep people in slavery, and the church then has the right to rule over the earth, you know. And then is the spiritual warfare is about you know this concept. So we find another reference of Jesus about the war the church has to engage the enemy. Matthew 16, there are instructed, uh, we are instructed to use weapons at our disposal to destroy the doors of uh, the adversary. You know? It's a very well known passage, you know, it's uh, recited so many times in the church, but do we really understand? You know? Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 19, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, here also, you know, Jesus speaks about uh, a battle. But we have to understand, you know, that uh, uh, Jesus has asked to his disciples, who do you think I am? First they asked, you know, who do you think the people said, you know, I am? And they had, you know, different answers. Then he asked to his disciples, and you, you know, what do you think, you know, I am? And Peter has the wrong, the right answer. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. For a Jew to say this, you know, he was recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, you know, the Son of God who came to save them. So it was a great statement. But also, it is a statement of faith. It's the statement of faith that can give us the salvation when we recognize Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one, the one sent by God to save us. You know? being the Son of God. So, this is the statement of faith of Peter. And Jesus take that statement, you know, and he said to people, blessed are you, and he called it Simon Bar-Jona, with his you know, original name, you know, I mean, Simon, son of the dove. You know, mm -hmm. <coughs> and Simon need like a little stone. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. I mean, is not, uh, you know, the Catholic Church says that on this statement, you know, Jesus made Peter the first pope. 
because he said that on Peter he will build his church. So on the Pope Peter he built his church and on the Pope that will follow. So the Catholic Church is built on the rock that is the Pope and he, he is the representative of Jesus on this earth you know, because he is the, um, uh, the vicar, you know, so it means vicar representative of uh, Jesus on this earth. But it's not like this. When we look at the verse, it says that <coughs> there's no on Peter, sorry, <coughs> it's not on Peter that he built it, no, the, oh, the church, but it's on the declaration of Peter. The rock that Peter used is the declaration. You are the Christ. And this is the declaration where Jesus built his church. Because all of us, we are part of the church of Jesus. Why? Because we declare Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God. You know, and we are saved recognizing him as the Son of God. So the rock is the declaration of faith. And he said, on this declaration I will build my church. And he said that uh, on this church, the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. So he put straight away a declaration of war. First he said, I will build my church, so I am the head of the church, nobody else. You know, Jesus is the head, and we are his soldiers in this case. You know, his body you know, and his, uh, his army. You know. And he gave a declaration of war. You know, there is a church on one side with his army, and there is the gates of hell on the other side. You know. In ancient time, the gates were very important. We have to understand what the gate means. You know, it's not just, you know, the gate of our door that we think, but this is the gate of a city. The gate of a city was a very important place. One, it was the place of authority. You know? The people in authority in a, in a city, normally were the elders of the city, they will meet at the, at the door. You know? Just at the entrance of the door, they will sit there for different reasons. One, to meet and to discuss about the business of the city, you know, and about their own business, and if there were a case, uh, the people would go to the door and, uh, you know, present it to the elders, and the elders will judge, you know, and also they will see people coming in and out, you know, and if they see a foreigner coming in, they will stop it and say, hey, who are you? Why are you coming in this city? You know, why are you here? Where you come from? So they were, you know, and place of authority, and if they decide that you're not coming in the city, you know, because we don't know you, they have to go, you cannot go in the city. So, you know, we see the authority. When Jesus said, you know, about, okay, don't get asleep. <laughs> when he said, you know, the door, he's speaking you know, about the door, he speak of a place of authority. And also is a place of defense, you know, when the enemy would come against the city, they were, you know, walled city, and the door, it was the place where the battle would rage. Why? Because the door at the same time is the weaker place. Because the door, the, the walls were, where, you know, stone, very high and solid, but the door, it was the weaker place. So the enemy would try to smash the door, you know, or burn the door, so when the door would collapse, they could go in the city and conquer it. So we see here, you know, the gates of Hades, they represent the authority of Hades, the authority of hell, so the authority of Satan, you know, but at the same time, the wicked place, you know, for Satan. And I believe that, you know, Jesus wanted to say that there is a city, this house, then he was saying you have to bind the man to conquer, the strong man to conquer the house. So... The kingdom of Satan is seen as a city or a house, you know, with a door, and inside there are all the souls of lost people, the sinners. They are in there. They are slaves of Satan. You know, like we, before knowing Jesus, we were slaves of Satan. We were in the kingdom of Satan, you know, slaves to him. You know. So the church has to go and take the souls, you know, out. And when we do it, so when we go out and testify, when we intercede, when we do our work, no, we go in uh, kingdom, in Satan kingdom. We take the souls and we take them out, you know, through this uh, this door. This is the spiritual battle because 
At the end of the day, the spiritual battle is about souls. It's not about our prosperity. It's not about our feeling good. It's not about us. We are already saved. So we are in the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus, you know, keep us, protect us, you know, and we can worship and adore him forever. But how many souls out there, they're still in darkness. They are on the verge of hell for eternity. So the church has to understand the spiritual battle is about getting souls saved, getting souls out of hell into heaven. You know, a famous evangelist he said, if I have to plant a church, I will plant it on the gate of hell. You know, so to save people just a moment before they get in. You know? and, uh, and it's true. You know, we have to fight the enemy to conquer souls. And we will see how many army God has given us and many, you know, opportunity to do that. <clears throat> so, the Bible describes heaven as the inhabitation of spiritual being. Every civilization has seen heaven as the spiritual place and even today people have an idea of what heaven or paradise should be. Paul described his spiritual experience to Corinthians 12 to 4. I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body I know not, or whether out of the body I I know not, God knoweth, such a one caught up even to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I not know, God knoweth, how that he was caught up in paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. This passage speaks of heaven as the third heaven. We have to remember that the word heaven, you know, sometimes we think about heaven as a cloud. You know? and there is a famous uh, advertisement in uh, Italy about uh, this guy taking a coffee, you know, an Italian coffee, uh, and he is in heaven, you know, taking this coffee with Peter, and it's all clouds, you know, and it's all clouds, and everybody's dressed in white, and they're having coffee and enjoying life there. And sometimes people have, you know, the idea of having something like this, and they will play harps with the angels, you know, for eternity, and kind of cocoon place. It's not that, you know. The word heaven in Greek is paradisos. Then he means garden. So even Paul, when he said he was caught up in the third heaven, he said, I was caught up in the third garden. So there are apparently three gardens. No one. Why three gardens? Because if you have a third, you must have a first and a second, isn't it? If you run a race and you say, I arrived third. How many of you are? Just me. He said, no, one moment, it's not possible, is it? <laughs> if you're right there, there must be a, a first and a second before you. you know? So, if there is a third heaven and a third garden, there must be a third heaven and a second heaven. So, let us try to see what they are. The second heaven. In the book of Revelation, we find a description of another heaven. In Revelation 3.13 said, and I saw and I heard an eagle flying in mid heaven, saying with a great voice, Woe, 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 for them that dwell on the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels who are yet to sound. The translation of the Greek word mesoranema, translated with in the middle of heaven, would be more appropriate in this way the heaven in the middle. And so this could be the second heaven. He said that this angel, you know, uh, this eagle only was an angel, you know, was flying in the heaven in the middle. So in the garden in the middle. This is, you know, the right translation of this. So there are angels or angelic beings, you know, fly in the garden in the middle. In this heaven in the middle. <clears throat> and we know that an angel of God has three functions. You know? One is to be the messenger for God. You know? uh, they are angels sent to protect those in danger. You know? And I describe it, angels who protect in Matthew 18, 19. 
And there are warrior angels that are in direct contrast with the demons. <clears throat> and that, in our imagination, is paradise, place of indescribable beauty and impurity. Probably is the third heaven. But when we speak of the second heaven, we speak of a place of work. <clears throat> and this is from, you know, this place, the second heaven, apparently, then Satan accused the saints of God. You know, so we see. It. <clears throat> so we have the third heaven. The third heaven so must be the place where God with his angels reigns. God is everywhere. God is not located in one place, obviously. God is all in all. You know, so we cannot locate him in one place. But we can say that uh, the third heaven is the place where God reigns completely. You know, where God has complete dominion and everything is subjected to him. So this is the third heaven. This is why it's so beautiful, it's so perfect. Paul said, and you know, the word is spoken to them, he cannot even repeat them here. And he has heard things, he has seen things, then you know, he has no reference to explain them. It's a bit like Ezekiel, the prophet. He saw a vision of this heaven, you know, and he tried to describe it to us like, you know, uh, wheels uh, that were going in all direction, full of eyes, uh, you know, and uh, fire. And then you saw this uh, uh, pavement uh, like, you know, uh, crystal glass and the throne and all these things. This is way to try to describe with earthly things something that he's never. And is uh, so different from us <coughs> that we are not able to uh, describe them because we understand and we see only the things that you know we know on this earth. That's our point. So everything is even is like when you have vision and the spirit. You know, what happened? Your spirit has the vision, and your brain somehow has to uh, download it. You know, has to make it uh, reasonable, understandable. So your brain start to work out what the spirit, you know, tell him. And he work it out in experience that he had before, in things that he can understand. You know what I mean? This is that, because <clears throat> the spiritual world, we cannot really understand, you know, or know. Because it's just different for us, for what we are, is our normal environment. So this is what the Bible tried to do. The Bible tried to Tell us with earthly things, spiritual things. What Jesus said, you know, he was a master in that because Jesus used the parables. <clears throat> and he said to his disciples, you know, uh, there are many things also that I want to say, but you're not able to understand, you're not able to receive. You know? And he said, if you don't understand the parables, then I tell you, how can I tell you the things that I saw in heaven, you know, that I heard in heaven? Because we cannot understand the third heaven really until we will get there. So at the moment, the Bible uh, explained us, try to explain us the third heaven, the second heaven, and the things you know of the spirit on earthly, using earthly things. You know, so we have to understand all of this. So for that, uh, Daniel or Revelation, they have all these monsters, you know, and dragons and you know, bird with you know bones in their mouths and strange things and you know people has tried to make everything out of it you know you can read books and books and books about you know these monsters and these beasts and these things but it's just a, a way you know uh, that uh, you know the, the bible tried to explain us you know of things then you know happening in the heavens you know people things happen in the spirit you know using symbolism but it's just symbolism we don't have to make too much out of it you know because we get confused you know? we are just to believe you know what god uh, that, that jesus will come back and when he come back everybody will know it mm -hmm. and before he come back there are signs to come but we are not uh, uh, to uh, put you know too much effort on the signs because people has been deceived for 2000 years waiting for Jesus convinced and all oh, these are the signs we are the generation we are the ones and boom the generation passed and 
you know, 2,000 years past and we're still here talking about it. We don't know when it's coming back. We recognize the signs when they happen, but not before they happen. You know, this is you know, the symbolism of the Bible. It just put it there so we can recognize after they happen, not before. Anyway, this was a parenthesis, yeah, <laughs> you know, to try to start to understand also all this uh, symbolism about demons, about Satan and his kingdom, you know, that we can get caught on it. So the scriptures tell us that Satan will be thrown out from that heaven, but until then it is him that dominates that heavenly place, and from there he leads his demonic guerrilla, guerrilla. In the book of Revelation, we find a description of another heaven. So, this second heaven probably is the reign of Satan, you know, the place where he established you know, his kingdom. You know, so, third heaven uh, is you know, the kingdom where, of, of God, where he rules sovereign. You know. The uh, second heaven is where Satan rules and he has his kingdom. And then we have uh, another heaven that is called the Garden of Eden. And this is this beautiful earth. You know, like you see here, you know, our beautiful earth. We have made a mess of it, but it's a beautiful place. <laughs> and if you travel the world, you know, you know how many beautiful places you know, this earth has. And it is a garden. It's a beautiful garden. And this garden, God has given it to men, you know, to keep it, to you know, grow in it, you know, to live in it, you know, and to do something very nice of it. So this is the first heaven, this earth. Okay, sometimes the other things, when we think about heavens, we think about like layers, you know. I mean, the earth is the first heaven, then we got, you know, a second heaven, like another universe, you know. And then we got uh, the third heaven, another universe, you know, englobing all this other universe. I don't see it like that. I see them as dimensions, yeah. you know, uh, dimensions. So we live in the natural dimension. You know, this is the universe created by God is a natural dimension, you know, created to, for us to live in this natural dimension. You know. the, Second heaven is another dimension. Well, these angels and demons, you know, work. And the third heaven is God's dimension, you know, where God, you know, reigns. And the great things about human being, we are actually, I believe, the only ones that have been created to live at the same time in no dimensions. You know, uh, we live in the first dimension with our body. But in our spirit, we live in the third dimension, mm -hmm. in heaven already, when we are saved. You know, because Paul said, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Obviously, that is a, an authority position. And we have this authority in the third heaven. You know? For that, our prayer, when I prayed, I prayed in the third heaven. And you know, God listened to it because we have this authority. And is the authority then uh, Adam had? Adam and Eve, they live in the natural and in the spirit. They have five natural senses and they have five spiritual senses. And they all work perfectly, like for Jesus. If you see when you know, Jesus was the, in the house of the Pharisees and John said he knew in the spirit what they were thinking and what they were saying. You know, because his five spiritual senses, they were so open, you know, he could hear not only with the natural ear, but with the spiritual ear. He saw not only in the natural, he saw in the spirit. And all his senses, they were open. And we're supposed to have these five senses, you know, spiritual senses open. You know, we have spiritual eyes, we have spiritual ears. But the problem is they're not working very well because of sin. You know, they're not really open and uh, you know so we have to pray and to work uh, work out your salvation you know so work in a way to open up our spiritual senses to become more and more spiritual being still being you know natural beings 
because I don't believe to become a spiritual man you need to go on the top of a mountain and live like an eremit, you know, for 20 years, you know, or 40 years, and then you are spiritual. No, you can live in this world, have a job, have a family, yeah, yeah. you know, and you know, go out having fun with friends and be very spiritual. You know, because Jesus was doing that. You know, he lived among people. You know, he was called the friend of the sinners, you know, because he was engaged, you know, with sinners. But nobody was so spiritual as Jesus, never been so spiritual as Jesus on this earth, isn't it? So, you know, we have to understand, we are called to live in the first heaven, and we are called to live on the third heaven, you know, as Christians. While the non-Christian live only in the first heaven, he has only the natural sense. He lives only by his soul, you know, it's a soulish being. And so he lived by his soul and by his flesh, and he's governed by his flesh. You know, and the enemy they use, you know, he, they, uh, con concupiscenza. Uh, how do you say in English? Concupiscenza. Uh, concupiscenza. Uh, I'm trying to think. 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 No, has been my me. So, what is a spiritual warfare then? Spiritual warfare is the, the second heaven, you know, try to get the first heaven. Try to, you know, invade. Uh, invade, exactly the word is, invade the first heaven. You know, and he does, you know, and invade the first heaven and rule the first heaven. So, it's no more human beings ruling the first heaven like it used to be, it's supposed to be. But now he's the demons, you know, he's these angels that fall down from the third heaven and now they're ruling the earth. So that Paul said, our war is not against flesh and blood, yeah. but against the spiritual world, you know. And, and this is it, again, the second heaven. So spiritual warfare is just engaging in the war between these heavens. And on the third heaven there is no war. Nobody, you know, as soon as you sing in the third heaven, you are out of it. Look at Satan. As he, you know, started to grow in pride and he sin with his pride, he was sent out because there cannot be sin in heaven. This is the reason why only people that are saved by Jesus Christ go to heaven. Because a sinner cannot go to heaven. He will make it no more the third heaven, you know, if there is sin there. So for that we have to be washed in the blood of Jesus, cleansed completely by the blood of Jesus, and then we can go in the heaven. Yeah. I have a question. So the prayer of Daniel, that's why I took, I'm just using this as the three heavens and the dimensions. Uh, that's why it took 21 days to get, because from the third heaven, trying to get to the second heaven, you see what I'm saying? To get to the first heaven, on dimensional wise, it, 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 it was the battle. Yeah, exactly. This, in fact, I used this example, like this example of Daniel, uh, to explain, you know, this uh, this war. You know, because uh, the, the astonishing thing is this: if you think that when Gabriel reached Daniel after twenty-one days, you know, fasting and praying, Gabriel said, you know, from the first day your prayer has been heard. You know, and I was sent from the first day, but it took me 21 days to think this. So, you see, these heavenly realities, realities in time, in, you know, in time and space, you know, there is a reality, because this angel could not reach, you know, Gabriel, until, you know, they were sent, uh, um, uh, what is the, the Michael. angels, Michael, mm -hmm. you know, to, Help him, yeah. you know. And I believe it's not just Mike. Michael. Michael is a, is an angel, you know, that he's a general and has many angels. But for the Jewish, he's the warrior angel. Yes. You know? So it's an army. So I think an army of angels, angels had to went to help Gabriel. And the word, you know, I can imagine an amazing spiritual battle there in the second heaven, you know, try to open the gates of hell. So they try to have an opening. And this, you know, barrier of demons, you know, so that Gabriel can go through and get, you know, to Daniel. I believe this kind of world is still on when we pray. When we start to pray for an area, you know, we will see 
uh, later uh, the, the, the teaching on the territorial spirits. Right? And what's happened? The territorial spirit is uh, owned in a way, you know, by these demons. You know? and when we, the church, start to pray, start to do the spiritual warfare, we open up the heavens. We open up the second heaven in the way that you know the, uh, the will of God and you know the blessing of God and everything God has prepared. You know, they start to come in a specific place. For that example, in this area where we, we are planting the church now in Briano, we came here you know, three years ago. We started to pray. You know, four, four years ago we started, and it was so hard. We were just you know a couple of us, and it was very very hard you know, just to pray, just to be here as Christians, because there never been an evangelical church here ever, you know, before. There never been a revival. So it means this area has dominated by demons, undisturbed for centuries. Yeah, exactly. you know, so they just hear, you know, and they have a light. Then they see light coming in the middle of the darkness, some Christians coming. You know, and then they start the battle. You know, and it was amazing hard, you know, this battle. But now after four years, you know, and we keep battling, the difference is already, you know, big. You know, we can feel them, the difference in worship, in praying, in going out and testify, you know, and all these things. Because heaven is opening. The more we pray, the more we go out to testify, the more we're planting, you know, cell groups and churches, you know, we will see the heaven open. You know, because we make the difference. We are the light of the world. Apart from us, there is no other light, isn't it? Jesus is saying, okay, it's no problem if you don't make light, I've got other light somewhere else, you know, and make a crocodile be a light of a dog be a light no isn't it <laughs> or oh, building be a light no we christians are the light of the world if there is no christian there is no light everything is just darkness you know he said you are the light and he said and if you go uh, you put under the table or you know under um, um secure you know anyway if you're hidden <laughs> you know yeah. nobody see the light you know you have to be out and show your light, and the light always cast out the darkness. You know, we have light here because we have, like, you know, light coming in. But if we switch off, you know, this light, this lamp, we close the window, there will be darkness here. We cannot see anything, you know, until somebody switch on the light, you know, and the darkness goes. But you see, until there is light, darkness cannot come in. It's not that uh, if it's dark outside, you know, and I open the window, you know, darkness come in. No, if I still have my light on, even if outside is dark, darkness will not come in. But if I have a light, my light, and I open the window, my light go out from the window, you know, and it will shine even out there. It's always the light prevailing over the darkness. For that, Satan kingdom is called the kingdom of darkness, and our kingdom is the kingdom of light. Oh, because we prevail. It's our nature to prevail. You know, it's just being in one place we prevail. You know, we make light. This another thing that Jesus said to the believers didn't say make light. He said you are the light. You see, it's not that we need to switch on, you know, and start making light. We are light. We can be hidden, you know, and not switched off. Wherever we are, we are light. Oh, it is exactly like I said. I go on the top of a mountain and I live there 40 years without seeing nobody, you know. Or I go like the, the nuns, they go in some convents and they, you know, close in and they don't see anybody, nobody see them. And they said, Oh, we are here to pray, you know. Are you not a light of the world? Yeah, it would be much better if you just go out and you do something out there and stay in to pray, you know. It's not that the light will be in the world.